Welcome to Black Youth TV as we try to promote peace, love, and unity in the community and try to convince the youth that the street life is not the way. I'm interviewing from Tiffany Gardens Industrial Terrace in downtown Kingston, Jamaica. Please remember to like and subscribe. I'm here interviewing the one and only Romy. Romy. Yeah. Why you call, why they call you Romy? That's just yeah, my, my uncle, I got that name from my uncle. Because um, my mom told me that when I was a kid, he used to come and get me every morning and he'd take me away and sometimes he haven't seen me back until I'll midday. You know, everywhere he's, he's at, he always have me at his side. So he gave me that name. I was given that name by my uncle. Yeah. You're always a room on the place, always. Always, always. Always. All right. You, you, you know the card game when they play a room in a community, you play that too? Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, man. We love that, man. You love that game, man? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man. When was you born? 1955, the 25th of March, 1955. So how old would that make you? 66. Yeah, my last birthday, 66. What school did you go to, Romy? I attend Denham Town Junior Secondary. I attend Boys Town and I attend Denham Town Junior Secondary. That's it. it. Boys Town is a primary school? Yeah, Boys Town was just a, 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 you could say a primary school. And then I'm telling you, the junior secondary. Was you a troublesome person or was you humble and focused? I was a humble person in school. Humorous. Yeah, that's, that's my thing. I always try to be humorous, you know, and stuff like that. But I'm not a, uh, I'm not a troublesome person attending school, you know. You like to make people, you say you're good at making people laugh. Yeah, yeah, that, that's you me. You like to see people happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you want to become when you was in school? My first aim in life was to become a jockey, a race ass jockey. That was my, was my real goal. That was the goal I'm trying to achieve. Yeah, being a, a jockey, a race ass jockey. That was, that's what you wanted to be when you was young? Yeah, yeah. What distracted you from that? Well, like I said, there was an accident on the track. One last race. There was an accident and around six guys that broke up. Yeah, it was a dangerous spill. Some was life threatening and some was just broken bones and stuff like that. So my mom got scared and divert from that, you know. So you actually started doing jockeying then? Yeah, I was actually start being apprentice. I was actually an apprentice, yeah. Because of the incidents that were happening on the race yeah. that's the reason why you stopped. Yeah, yeah. My mom got scared, you know. Yeah. Did you get in trouble with the police at all? I've been in jail, but like just curfew, you know, like they have a curfew, a raid, you know, and they just pick up guys and take you to the station, detain you and, you know, yeah. So you've never been charged for or anything? Yeah, charged once for five pound a weed. Okay. Yeah. Would you, go to, would you go to get in jail or go to prison for that? I go to jail, I pay a fine. Pay a fine of seventy-five dollars. Yeah, this was back in nineteen seventy-five. Nineteen seventy-five. Yeah. Seventy-five. How much was seventy-five dollars those times? Seventy-five dollars were a lot of money. Yeah, those back those days, nineteen seventy-five. You have seventy-five dollars, you're rich. Yeah, that's twenty-five dollar fifty. Me, I work for Crash Program, and that could have maintained me and my girlfriend and my kids. And yeah, yeah. 25.50, so 75 was a, was a big lot, a big man to know, you know. The amount of weed that you got COVID, it, it was a lot compared to now? Five pounds, it's still five pounds, you know what I'm saying? But in those days... It was considered more serious. Yeah, it was more serious, yeah, yeah. Back then, if you can't pay the fine, you go to Spanish Town and do some time, you know? Yeah. Growing up in Denham Town, did you, did you at any time, did you find that you need to have a gun or anything at any point to defend yourself? Well, like I said, the gun thing came about when we were kids, 12, 12, 13 growing up. There was, we had two gangs, two youth gangs, yeah, Black Ants and Metic. Black Ants was from Rima and Metic is from Denham Town. Yeah, so 
We used back then it was normally Buckland stone and stuff like that. So one night we went down, you know, with our Buckland stone. And when we reached down by Wellington Street by the park, yeah, we, it was some gunshot coming our way. Yeah, and we had to retreat. Yeah. So we retreat and we decide that we gonna have to do something about this. Yeah, so that is how we come about now and start to make homemade guns, homemade shotgun. But those days it was thunderbolt. We use the thunderbolt in the thing and pull it up and stuff it like a musket and fire the thunderbolt and you know, you swear with a shotgun here. Yeah, yeah. You see? So you tell me you can make guns with your hands? Yeah man, thunderbolt man, bicycle fork man, sago post. Bicycle sago post, you know, you just bore a hole at the top with a, with a little string, and you tie the thunderbolt weak, you drop the thunderbolt weak, and you ram it from the top, broken buckle, you know, piece of cut off steel and stuff like that. Yeah, when you fire that man, you swear it's a, a shotgun man. Holy pellets are fly all about. You know what I'm saying? It's reliable? Yes, man. It's more than reliable, man. Yeah. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. How old was you when you fired your first gun? Oh, well, uh, uh, like I said, 12. 12 years old. Yeah. You fired your first gun. How did that feel? Well, make you feel like, you know, make you feel powerful. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because at that time, like I said, I was part of a youth, youth gang. Yeah, and I was up, I was up in, I was up there, I was up there, yeah. Yeah, my dad was sand belly, he had job bless his soul, you know. Yeah, that was my dad, you know. And Danny Miller, yeah. Them two guys, they, they were the, they were the dad for a little youth thing, yeah. And yeah. So how, how, how did you survive then growing up on the street? How did you survive? Well, I was very much fortunate, you know, because growing up, a, a lot of stuff that other guys had to do to survive, I really did not to go down that route. Yeah, like I'm saying, you know, I was one of the fortunate one, you know. Plus, I have my families in the States and stuff like that, you know. And that's how I used to get along, you know. Yeah. Your reasons for having a gun was it strictly to farm, defending yourself, or was it literally to for going for war? It's not really for war, no. it's just a matter of defending yourself, you know. Yeah, that's why it's really break down to because in the ghetto, in the ghetto as we all call it, yeah. If you don't, if a guy know you don't want something, you are vulnerable. You get what I'm saying? But from a guy you know you have your thing, a guy you go up, it's a different approach. You get me? Yeah. A guy you know say you don't stay away, you're very much vulnerable. But from a guy you know say you have your thing, a guy you go know say boy, you're not a pushover. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, having a gun is like, not only if, it, if war comes, then you can back away. But my thing about gun back then was to protect, protection. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Would you walk with it every day? No, not, no, not an everyday thing. I did not have reason to. I did not have reason to walk with it every day. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, tell me, have you ever been shot before? Yeah. How many times? Once. Once? Yeah. And where was that? I was coming off a demonstration back in the 70s and there was a shooting behind hospital yeah and I was the only person that shot that day yeah and if it wasn't for this guy banking no deceased and um banking and the next guy yeah if it wasn't for them two guys pitchy probably I wouldn't be sitting here now giving you this interview yeah because Pichy, Pichy had a, a pickaxe stick angle under his sweatsuit cap. And this next guy was 
shot was firing all over and picture every time and picture was posing with his stuff with this pickaxe stick and that's what saved my life yeah yeah oh, if, if, if that never happened you wouldn't even be here today probably i wouldn't be here yeah besides what i mean there was a lot of people and i was the only one that shot in the crowd so that just to tell you you know what where else is good where is he now who the guys who is that yeah the guy you see that uh, helps save your life. one of them is still alive and one is deceased he died in england a couple years ago where where in your body was he shot he was shot right here and it come through on my back did that not inside you or no it fly through it fly through yeah you got a hospital for that I could not attend the hospital, you know. I have to deal with the woman every day, you know. Because back then, through all the politics and all of that, as near as hospital, I got shot right at hospital back gate. And I couldn't go in the hospital. Couldn't, because if I enter in the hospital, I would charge for shooting. And I'm the one who got shot. Those days, from you come from Tivoli or Rima, you get shot, you can't go to hospital. I your charge a police shooting or some form of shooting. So you go home and do it yourself? Yeah, I forgot go home. I forgot go home and deal with some, you know, backdoor thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man. In your time in the 60s, I understand that everything was fine between Tivoli Gardens and then a town. Yeah. What started if you? How did it all break up? What caused the, the, the um, separation? Well, then I'm town and Tivoli. It's one, it's, it's one community, you know. Yeah, it's just that they said Denham Town and Tivoli, but it, the whole place is Denham Town. The only difference is that the scheme, Tivoli Guard, yeah, and they were, they were one. You know, I don't know what all of a sudden caused this breakaway, you know. I couldn't really say, but I know they were one, we all were one, you know. And, you know, this breakaway, I can't really put my finger to say it's because of this or because of that, you know, because sometimes, you know, there's no, there, there's no finger pointing, you know, no need to find a finger. You get what I'm saying? So because, between what time was Denham Town and Tivoli on good terms before the end? For a long while, for a long, long while, this, this all just started like around in the in the 2000 in the in the two the thousand yeah this just started just in the 2000 why why the, why the world just started all of a sudden well i like i'm saying i couldn't really you know put my finger to say this is what i this is what yeah i'm not i'm not in a position to really disclose the reason for that or what 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 parties in Tivoli Gardens? GLP. GLP. Yeah. And what parties in Town? GLP. GLP? Yeah. So they're both on the same side? Yeah. But yet still now? Yeah. There There's a feud. You see, it, they're not only us. It's not only Tivoli and Denham Town. It's happening all over. It's happening in Jonestown Jungle. It's happening in Payne Avenue. It's happening out of East. It's happening all over. People that are on the same side for some reason or the other, they go at it. You know what I'm saying? It's not only in the West. This is something that takes place all over. All over. Yeah. Right now things are going on the jungle. Same way. And a PMP them still are saying. You get what I'm saying? Things are going on the West. Same way and the people are still there, right? The people are saying. You get what I'm saying? So it's just that, you know, in every, in every walks of life, or in every garrison then, you always have a set of guys that feel like they are untouchable, uh, you know, and that's what always the cause the problem most of the time. In the 60s when I was growing up, all right, the Dan was, a man named Foley, like the foul foot, yeah? Rupert English, yeah? Them man that was the done when I grew up around the song, yeah? Busby, 
We have a man named Busby. Yeah. Yeah. Cry tough, them call him. You know? Yeah. Them man know what they done. You see me? Yeah. When I grew up around the 70s, 60s. Yeah. How long yeah. did the Dutch last for? Excuse me? How long did the Dutch last for before them, somebody else turned up? Them yeah. man there, them man they are done for a long, long while, man. Them man they are done for a long while. You see me? All when the man they will leave the community and go to the next community, the man they still represent. You see me? Yeah, man, do pretty English. This is now. Yeah, like the four foot at, yeah, at Bravo. You see me? This is now. Yeah, tan tan. The sea is now. All of them man there. The sea is now. You know? So who, yeah. who, okay, who was controlling the place in, in the 1990s? Well, in the 70s coming up now, it's a different thing. Now we have curly locks, you have Orinado, yeah, and stuff like that. You see me? A different thing growing up now, because them hell of the, you know, leave the community and get big now, turn big man now, and things and things, and the youth them now start dealing with the thing, you know? Yeah, you have man like Nardo, Curly Locks, you know, the man there, you know? Top Cat and Dark the Vicious and, you know, the man there, you see me? The man that comes start dealing with the thing, right up until, you know, the eight is. Kind of the eighties, most of them pass off. You see, yeah. Who no got a foreign disease, you know? Yeah. So now in the 20th century now, 2021, is there anybody who's controlling the place now? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a big question. That's a very big question. Yeah, with a big sign. You know that big question sign? Big question mark. Yeah, big question mark. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, a lot of people say they control, they, they, they just for the sake of more attack. No control, no control, no control, you know? Yeah, man. The thing, the thing, the thing, water down. You see me? Yeah, the thing water down, big time. Tell me, Romy, guns in the 60s to guns now in the, in the 20th century, how have they upgraded to you? Well, in the 60s, you know, the most powerful rifle they had around those days were probably a 303 rifle or an SLR. Yeah? In this 20th century now, we are talking about AK-47. We are talking about M-16. We are talking about a whole, yeah, a whole variety. Uh, a weapon advanced from back in the 60s. In the 60s, my growing up, uh, one and two guys have gone. You know what I'm saying? But now, <laughs> all the toddler, if you tell you, say, don't doubt him. You see? Yeah, that's how the gun thing is now, to then. You know? Because if you have a gang back then, in the 60s, Probably four or five men in the whole entire gang have gone. And the gang have more than that, probably 10, 12, 15 men. And there were four guns there. Some probably have all one. Now we are talking about gang, now we are talking about guns. You know, we talking about just gun. guns. Guns we talk about now. All variety of guns. You know, so back then to now, you can't, there no comparison. To be honest, there's no comparison. So, uh, Jamaicans being to be like America, everybody have a gun. It look like I, I down the road, the road for area now, you know? But in, in America, there's a law, there's a law, so you can get guns legally. Over here, there ain't no law like that, but everybody no. still have guns. No, you, you see, you can get guns legally, you know, but you have to be a business person. Okay. You have to own business or property, yeah? If you own a lot of properties and you own business, you have to have things to show that, you, you know, you deserve to own a gun. In America, it's totally different, you know. Every generation, the um, badness change. Every generation. Yeah. I ask you between 60s and 70s, yeah? yeah? Sorry, 60s and 80s. Yeah. What was the badness like then compared to now? All right. 
the badness in her sixties coming up to eighties, yeah, was a different type of badness from the eighties to now, the two thousand. Yeah. I would I would say then, back then it was analog. Now it's digital. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, back then it was analog, digital now. You know, see, the type of guns that are around now are far more advanced than the guns that used to be around back in the days. You see, all the man with them like a pea shooter and a little fire shooter slogan, all these things. Yeah, back in my days, as a youth growing up, you never hear nothing about no desert eagle and no, all these things. Yeah? Yeah, in the 80s, coming up, a bit, you hear about them guns there. Now, 2000, you hear about that version. Yeah? Every, every time, you know, they always, you know. Do you think it makes any difference to what party, what party is in power, depending, depending on how much gun is on the street? All right, I'm going to be honest to you. Yeah? He's a shower man, but not afraid to tell the world that. Yeah? But, Whichever party in power, gun is going to always be here, beyond control. Gun, because what happened, you know? You have to look, it, you have to look at the ratio. You know? Enough time government get blamed for a lot of things, where beyond for them, even for them control, you know? Because I come man out, so I do the same thing, where you understand me, and then everything you can see. Yeah, no, no one no capable of can see and know everything what's going on. You get what I'm saying to you? So it no really matter which party in power. You get what I'm saying to you? Gonna go always dead. Yeah, it go always dead because one time ago, the step of them used to look towards the politician. You no, know, a different thing. No man not be a no look for no politician to do nothing for him. Because he have him link and he have him dollars and he can do him things, so he does do him things. You get what I'm saying to you? No, I don't have to wait for Mr. Tom or Mr. Harry. You get me? I know the way we can send something go so, and can do something there so, and right, right, right. And you get the thing, and you know. I don't say, say that the way, you know, and that's the road we should all go down. But I just heard there. Yeah? And, if what, what, what I what I what I what I'm but all right, you see, see him like how oh, when we I leave Jamaica go abroad, all at the airport where I get searched and checked, you know, before we board the plane, you know. Yeah? I know what things them I get checked same way. Yeah? So I feel like same way when people coming from abroad, coming to Jamaica, I send things. I see him way search should I check from abroad before it come here to that probably will help control and stop a lot of these things, these, these gun smuggling things and a mash up with beautiful little island. Yeah, Jamaica, the, a little, little piece of that on the map. Yeah, yeah. And we had still had the beautifulest thing on the face of your earth. Jamaica. Jamaica, a paradise. Not because I'm born here and I'm a Jamaican, but I tell you what I know. So I'm a travel there to 14 parish. Yeah? And I see and I know that. I live abroad, I live in England, I live in America, I live in Canada. And I, I hear how people talk about Jamaica. People that never been to Jamaica, they are so dying anxious to come to Jamaica. And now we have a thing named Trench Town now, that is my homeland. Trench Town, when you talk about Trench Town now, everybody, the whole world want a piece of Trench Town. Yeah, the whole world want a piece of Trench Town, and it's there for everybody. What's so, what's so special about Trench Town? Because the special thing about Trench Town, one, the, the, the home of reggae music. Trench Town is the mecca. Trench Town is the mecca of reggae music. What artists grew up in Rima? A whole lot of artists grew up in Trench Town, man. Rima, man. You have Toots and the Matels. You have Wailing Souls. You have Knowledge. You have Ernie Wrangling is a, is a, is a product of Trench Town. 
the great Ernie Wrangler, a product at Trenchtown, Ford Street. Yeah? All these greats. So Trenchtown have to be what it is. Yeah. A, a great place. Yeah. You know Bob if I know Bob Marley, if I know Bob Marley, that's a good question. Yeah? I used to, back in the days, when Bob, Peter and Bunny used to rehearse, and you know, like they take a break, get a little snack. I was one of the youth who used to run with one little man named Sango, go buy the fried dumpling and salt fish and snowball. Yeah, them things that they used to do at a youth home, Bob Marley, Peter Touch, Bunny Wheel lads, yeah, Tata Ford, yeah. That are the man who write a song for Bob. Yeah. Yeah, them man they used to defend Bob. Yeah. Bob have three man where I mean, the man they I mean bridging them. When, when the man they, when you see Bob and the man they you're afraid for them fever. Because Bob is a brown skin man, you know. And when you see Bob and the man they walk, you don't know, want to utter nothing. You have a man named Bobby Reds. You have a man named Chacho, yeah? And you have a man named Chacharu. Chacharu, I want like a shark man, so I got him bad. Yo, was it any of the above people that you just mentioned that told him that it would be okay to come back to Jamaica? Can you remember when he, he went to England? Yeah, and yeah, when he, he going, he when he he go in exile. Come back to Jamaica, he not to worry about nothing. Yeah, he okay. yeah. Was, 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 is those three people one of those people? No, no, those, those guys wouldn't be part of that influence. That was more from a different, yeah? That was more from some different people. You get what I'm saying? So the, the friends of Bob, of Bob Marley that told him that he can come back to Jamaica, they will look after him, he's going to be all right. You know those people? Yeah, man. You know them very well. They're all deceased now. They're all deceased now. Yeah. Do you believe in God? Are you a spiritual person? Yeah, yeah. when you say believe in God, you have to, you have to, I mean, come more specific. You know? Okay, are you a spiritual person? But yeah, man. Growing up in yeah. Denham Town with so in, much in danger, so much yeah. dangers yeah. around you yeah. and being through so much, yeah. do you have a belief that God, in God and, that, and, and a creator, and that he helped you through it all while you're here now? Yes, man, of course. Of course. Yeah, I've been through a lot. I've been through so much, and if it wasn't for him, probably, like I said before, I couldn't be sitting here giving you this interview right now. You understand? Because like I told you before, we had a, we had a, a, a demonstration with how much hundreds of people, hundreds of people, and we walk into a, into a shootout. And I was the only person get shot in that shootout. So, I mean, if it wasn't for God, then, you know, that's how we have to see it. If it wasn't for God, probably, and where I get shot, could be somewhere else. Could be somewhere more fatal. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, you have to put joy in the thing, brother. You have to put God in the thing. So you're you planning to be, plan to get baptized and becoming a Christian? No, well, it's not a matter of being baptized and becoming a Christian, you know. Because you don't have to do all of that for really, you know. You don't have to baptize to say you, 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 you love God. You don't have to be a Christian to love God. Yeah, because God is love and love is God. You understand? So, from we all accept and know that there is a creator and there is a supreme being, then that's it. You know? Yeah, me, that man will read my Bible, you know? Yeah, I don't read it every day, but I read my Bible. You see, because there comes a the time when you have to draw feet. And like the Father said, when you're in trouble, you know? If I call up on him, you get what I'm saying? So more time, you know, some little thing face you, some little thing come your way. And you have to really have to draw for the Bible and Father, where really I go on, you know? And, you know, I hate that, you see. How do you think so many guns come in to Jamaica? Well, all right. Watch this now. We, we, we our little port, you know, our little water outside, you know. We don't have the manpower to really man 
the thing outside there. I don't think we have the manpower to do so, to do it. So that's why I always, some loophole will always be there. Loopholes will always be there. You get me? Because from you don't have the manpower to deal with the situation, you're going to always have, yeah? Always have glitches. How do you think, or what, what, what barriers can be set in place, do you think, to stop guns coming to the country? What barrier can be set? The bribe is them. The people that love to take bribe. The people that love to take bribe? Yeah. It can't, it can't be just be any people on the road. So who are you referring to? Government people? The, the people that are in a, in a position where can stop it. The people that are in a position where can stop it. Yeah. You said you made, you said before that you traveled to America, to England, in Canada. Canada. Yeah. What was the experience like? Very much a learning process. I experienced that I really. I would even my worst enemy. I would encourage to try to get an outside experience of, of what life and outside that Jamaica is really all about. You know what I'm saying? Because some people look at it that through there from the ghetto and them born and grown a ghetto and you know, whatsoever, whatsoever. There's nothing there for them. But there's a lot of opportunity out there. Just you have to just go out there and, you know, hunt for what you want, you know, seek for what you want, you know. So you've been to the United Kingdom, right? Yeah. Okay. How did it feel when you came off the plane yeah. and smelled a different scent of fresh air in the air? How did it feel, uh, smelling that different scent of fresh uh, air, feeling the climate change? Uh, let me tell you this. The first country, I, the first country outside Jamaica I've been to is America. I was living in America for 14 years. Yeah. All my years growing up was around my mom's and my mom's family. I never, I didn't know my dad until I was 21. My dad went to England in 1956, and I didn't meet him until I was 21. Yeah. So my first experience in England in 1998 was a very, very much, I, I can't even, I don't even know how to explain it. When I land, when I land at, at, at um, that airport, yeah, the feelings, knowing that I'm going to be with my dad, although I was a big man then, but just to know that I was going to be around my dad was a, a beautiful feeling, you know? Wonderful, wonderful. Was it, was it easy to adjust? Was it easy to adjust to the new country? Yeah, well, somewhat, because like I said, I was living in the States before. Yeah, I was living in, England, in America before. So it wasn't, wasn't really hard to, you know, adjust the, the system. The cold weather never bothered Yeah, no, no, not much, not much, not much, not much, because that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, you see, so it's like coming out one and going into the other. Only that the England climate is really a different climate from the American climate, you know, but somehow I adjust to it, yeah. You say you was there for 14 years. Did you get arrested at all? Did you go to jail or prison? In the States? In the States, yes. Yeah, I've been to jail. What was that for? For weed. For weed? Yeah. How long, and how long did you get? I, I got one year. I got probation. I got probation. Yeah, one year, one year jail time and two year probation. When you went, when you went to America, did you go there legally or illegally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mom filed for seven of us. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, what about in England? Did you get in trouble with the police at all with the law in England? Just overstayed. overstayed. Yeah, I overstayed my time. Yeah. Okay. How would you describe now the, the, um, the badness between New York yeah. and England? Well, England, England is nothing to compare to New York with badness. No, no, no comparisons there. None whatsoever. Why is it no comparison? 
because New York is a, is a more deadlier place than England. It's only the police walk with gun in England. Not even the police walk with gun in England. Yeah? In America, police walk with gun and rude boy walk with gun just the same. In, 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 in England, in England, a guy is afraid to walk with him gun. A guy will take a chance, but most guys are afraid. In America, nobody is afraid to walk with them gun. Because gun is, is just the norm in America. Describe to me and tell the difference, yeah? The fact that you traveled to England, New York, and Port and Grove, Jamaica. Describe the badness between Jamaican badness and England badness. Jamaica badness is a different badness from England badness. No badness that are England. No badness that are England. Jamaica badness there. Yeah, man. No badness that are England. England trying to do bad. Looking back now, do you think you should have done this to make you a better person now? It goes like this. Life is not really what you want to make it, you know. Yeah, because you, you set out on the right path, but you eventually end up in the left lane, if you understand what I mean. You get me? So, sometimes people might say, look at him, and you know, him should have been at this, and him should have been at that, and look up. Yeah, and it's speaking, that's what you should really be. That whole life did shape at one stage. But somewhere along the line, something come along and deter you from that plan. So, you know, it's not really what you did wanted. A lot of people see out there on the street living homeless. That, that wasn't them plan. That wasn't their plan to live homeless. But somewhere along the line, something come along. And, you know, that's where they end up. You know, were you, just, so, were you someone that keep a lot of friends or you just kept yourself to yourself? No, I got a lot of friends, man. I got a lot of friends. A lot of friends. I got white friends, I got black friends, I got cool friends, I got Chinese. I got a lot of friends. Any of your friends that you grew up with? Yeah. Did they hit the headlines for any serious offenses, any serious crimes? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Tell me about the serious people that make you grow up with. Curly locks. Nada push out. Yeah. Busby. Yeah. Foley. Lady Cooper. Yeah. Zachy the High Priest. All them guys that we grew up with. You know. And them people that were bad people who make headlines. Yeah. What advice would you give to the youth now that watching this watching this right now? Yeah. What I would say to the youths right now, all around the world, not only in Jamaica, all around the world, but I have to talk mainly about Jamaica, especially my ghetto area. Yeah, please, I beg you now, stop it. For the sake, not just for the sake of you all, but remember, we don't have mama, we don't have grandmama, we don't have grandfather, and all these things. For the sake of them, and the kids them that are coming up, we have a future. Please, make them have some life. Please, I beg on the youth and youth out there. 66 year old this attack too now. Get, born and grow in a Rima. Yeah, we know all about it. I was there from the start. First youth young start in a Rima, me apartheid. Yeah, 10 grand and 4 great grand. I beg on the youth and youth. Give the youth them a chance. Yeah, blessing. Thank you very much for your yeah. for Black Q TV. Yeah. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Mm -hmm.